Why doesn't capital flow from rich to poor countries? This is the title of a famous paper by Robert Lucas in 1990, and this problem is also widely known as the Lucas Paradox. The idea goes something like this. If we make assumptions along the lines of the solar growth model, and so we have two countries producing the same good with the same constant returns to scale production, with output coming from the same homogeneous capital and labour inputs, then if production per worker differs between these two countries, it must be because they have different levels of capital per worker. We've just ruled every other possible explanation out using our initial assumptions. Then, assuming this, the law of diminishing returns for capital implies that the marginal product of capital is higher in the poorer country. What does this mean? It means that the returns to investment must be higher in the poorer country. If this is all true, then if trade in capital goods is free and competitive, then new investment will only occur in the poorer country instead of in our richer country. This will continue to be true until capital labour ratios, and hence the wages and capital returns, are equalised across these two countries. Lucas, in his 1990 paper, does some rough working to estimate the marginal product of capital in India must be around 58 times higher than in the USA using these assumptions. If this was true, then returns would be so much higher in India that capital would fly into India from America. American investors would only want to invest in India if the returns were 58 times higher than domestically. In reality, of course, we do observe some investment from rich to poor countries, but nowhere near the level we would expect if this estimate is anywhere near true. So what can explain this huge gap in theory and practice? To start looking into explaining this, we need to alter our initial assumptions of the model. The first way that Lucas tries to explain these differentials is introducing differences in human capital into the model. Workers in the United States on average have much more education and training than the equivalent workers in poorer countries. By using some rough estimates in his paper, this reduces the ratio of marginal product of capital from 58 down to 5. However, a differential of 5 is still very large, and if returns were 5 times higher in poorer countries, we would still expect to see large inflows of capital into poorer countries. So this doesn't explain the whole differential. The next possible explanation could be that there are external benefits to capital. This means that working with more productive workers increases the productivity of each worker. For example, they learn new techniques and there's knowledge spillovers from one worker to another. By using this in his paper, this decreases the differential to one, or we could equivalently say that this completely solves the problem. However, it does make some very strict assumptions. We would expect that knowledge spillovers would also be international, or at least some of them would. So this doesn't fully explain the difference. For example, if we have technological innovations in the USA, lots of the world, or all of the world, would be able to benefit from some of these innovations, especially now that we have the internet and there is quick information transfer across the world. So how else can we explain this? Well, the third hypothesis is that we have capital market imperfections. For rich country investors to be willing to invest in a poor country, they need to be sure that the poor country won't break its contract to pay back interest on the capital in the future. This can be seen as a type of political risk. However, this political risk wasn't the case when we had imperialism and colonialization in across much of the world. For example, when Britain col colonized a number of nations, 
he'd enforce the same contract laws for all the countries. And we could have had investment from one country into a poorer country, and they would have been almost certain that their investment would have been fulfilled, or at least it would have been fulfilled to the same extent as if they'd invested domestically. So why didn't countries equalize their marginal product per capita when we had colonialization? This brings about the fourth hypothesis, and this involves the colonial powers argument. And it says that when we had colonialization, the imperial powers would restrict capital flows on purpose to poorer countries. This was because these powers had monopoly power over the capital flows, whereas they had monopsony power over labour markets domestically. By restricting capital flows, this meant that they could keep wage rates very low in the colonies, and so as a result, there remains a cheap form of labour, and this maximises the profits of the colony. However, since colonialization is a thing of the past and we've started to see countries wind down their empires, why haven't poor countries caught up since the imperial powers no longer have this sort of power to restrict capital flows? Clearly there is still a bit of ambiguity there, but the truth is that this is not really a paradox. There are plenty of possible explanations for why capital doesn't flow from rich to poor countries. It's just that our initial model was unrealistic and the explanations positive, posited don't fully explain why the marginal product per capita has not been equalised. However, as we continue to develop our models, we expect that they will become more accurate and we can fully explain the truth. But as I say, this is not too much of a paradox. That just about wraps up this video. If it was at all interesting or useful, please do drop a like and subscribe for more videos in the future.